Okay, so a big part of this process of doing science is publishing. So just to get oriented, how many of you have published a paper? <laughs> okay, so most everybody. And how many of you are expected to publish as part of your job or your career track? Okay. So basically this is bread and butter, right? This is what we all do and we all need to do. Now, who likes writing? That's okay. Very general statement. Huh? No, who likes scientific writing? <laughs> so at least there were fewer hands this time, right? And that's the whole point of it. Maybe you don't have to enjoy it, but you do have to do it. And so the question is how do we make this process kind of less of a burden, less of something you have to struggle to do and more of something that you do just like anything else. And I, I've seen with a bunch of people that, I mean it's called writer's block, but I've seen that this is, this is a hurdle. You know, this is something that you don't enjoy doing or you have to you know, wait until you have nothing else on your, on your desk to do, which means you don't do it or you don't do it as frequently as the people who evaluate you would like you to do it. Or require you to do it. <laughs> um, and in some senses, it's all a strange game. And so one of the things I'll try to do in this kind of two or three hour mini course is to show you some of the places where, where people frequently make mistakes and lose the game. Okay? Obviously part of it is, can you write well? Okay? Can you express ideas crisply, clearly, cogently? Can you guide people through thinking so that they think the way you're thinking? They don't have to agree with you but they at least have to understand you. So part of it is that. But then part of it is strategies and essentially playing a game. So let's, let's get into this. And essentially what I'm going to do is to take you through a process, okay? First thing is obviously to write the paper. And actually before that, this course assumes that you're done with the analyses you've understood your data, you've gotten to the conclusions, you know what, the, what your results are, okay? So then you have to write the paper, you have to clean up the manuscript, just the way you cleaned up your data, okay? You have to put it in the correct format for the journal, submit it to the journal. Then there's a couple of steps where it's the editor's choice. He or she decides whether the manuscript is at all worth considering and may or may not send it out to review. In fact, yesterday, Lindsay got an email which she misread and she said, oh look, my paper got sent out to review. And then she read it again and she said, oops, it didn't get sent out to review. <laughs> but a week before she submitted that paper to that journal, I had submitted a paper to the same journal. And so I was kind of thinking, oh, I didn't get an email, so maybe mine did go out to, to review. <laughs> and then I read my email. <laughs> <laughs> so then if it goes out to review, the reviewers come back and provide you with suggestions and criticisms. The editor decides whether to accept or he or she can bump it back to you and to the reviewers and this can go on for several iterations 
at some point you are revising and then hopefully at some point your paper is accepted. Proofs are sent to you some point later. You make the corrections to proofs. Arturo pointed out something, no, one of you pointed out something to me in one of my papers that was unintelligible. Yeah, in, in fact, I think in the Brazil paper, and that was surely an error in correcting proof. And then this last point, or next to the last point, is where the open access commentary is not going to come in today, but usually comes in, and then your paper is published. Okay? So that's kind of the whole process. And there are some things that you know, I can't help you a lot with. I can give you ideas. But then there's a lot of other things where it is a game. And if you know how to play the game, it's a lot easier to be successful. So let's kind of start into this process, okay, into this sequence. So when we talk about writing, we're talking about very different type of writing from, you know, when you write a letter to your mother or to your girlfriend or boyfriend. This is not, you know, you're not graded on, wow, he wrote me four pages, he must miss me. Rather, this is how clearly do you express the ideas. So, right away the strategy begins. Okay? And just to give you kind of one, um, one comparison, one decision that you have to make as far as strategy, think about the papers you've read by other people. Sometimes a really interesting paper is like four or five pages. It deals with one topic. It proposes a hypothesis, <coughs> tests it, and states the conclusion. Done. And then other times you read a paper that's 20 pages long and has all this kind of complexity of purpose and multiple results and a long discussion. And both of those are valid. But you really need to think about which one of those or where on that spectrum fits you. So for example, you can make your paper very short, kind of a, a single issue paper or a single uh, point being made. And those papers are easy to write because they have a simple message. They're probably also easy to read Right? Because they basically ask a single question and answer it. And then the, the other advantage to shorter papers, which is probably not a real advantage in the big picture, is that there are more publications on your, on your CV at the end of the day. <coughs> we'll talk about that again in the disadvantages as well. The advantages of a long and complete paper is that the whole story is there in one place. And so your reader doesn't have to find the other paper or the other three papers that give the rest of that story. And thanks to that, you're likely to have a greater impact. <coughs> so for example, Many times our impact as scientists is measured by how frequently other scientists cite our papers. And if you have a lot of papers, each of which tells you know, a quarter of a story, it's hard for people to find all of them and cite all of them. But if you have fewer papers that tell more of the story, then they tend to get cited more. Now each of these has disadvantages. Short and sweet can dilute the message just because your reader is seeing the same introduction or almost the same introduction, the same data, and they kind of get lost. None of us concentrates fully, 100%, when we read other people's writing. And you know, you get into another paper by Peterson about such and such, and you just cruise through the introduction because you've already seen it before. 
okay? And so more papers is actually a disadvantage because people, people stop concentrating. As I said, the reader has to search for the whole story across more papers and there's less impact per publication. But the long and complete papers are more difficult to organize and write. The message can get complicated, which is to say, um, if you're not really good and really careful to <coughs> keep the flow of your writing understandable, then you lose people. You know, you have it clear in your head that I'm thinking of that, that analysis where I did this and this, but your, your reader loses that point. So this is, there's no right answer here. And there are middle grounds. But you need to be thinking about kind of how complex is the message. And sometimes, you know, to get to the complete message, your methods section gets huge because you're explaining three different things. So sometimes that pushes you this way. You know, you're, maybe the methods involved in getting to the more complicated, more complete picture are so different that it's very hard to say, you know, introduction to part A and part B, methods to part A and part B, results in part A and part B, and discussion of part A and part B that might be a situation where you go that direction. But for example, if, the, if a single introduction might suffice for A and B, and the same methods with a couple of sentences different, and then another paragraph in the results and another section in the discussion, that probably should push you this direction because you're getting some economy, right? You're, you're not having to repeat your introduction and most of your methods. Now that also maps onto the journal that you're aiming at. And we're gonna talk about choice of journal. Um, if you're <coughs> wanting to and able to publish in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the US, the papers are short. And in fact, in many of the higher end journals, <laughs> Your methodology goes either at the end or there's a little kind of methods abstract and then the methods go online, which I actually don't like at all because it means that the reader doesn't necessarily have your methodology in front of him or her. And then at the other end of the spectrum, if you go to a journal like Quarterly Review of Biology, those are intended to be long, complicated reviews. So this choice of long and short is also corresponding to choice of journal. Okay? So how do we choose the journal? And this is, this is really a, an exercise in self-honesty. Which is to say, everybody's excited about his or her project, okay? And so everybody probably in his or her heart is thinking, yeah, this ought to be in science or nature. But we have to be honest, right? There are some, uh, there are some papers and products that we will produce that are best off in a journal at this level there's some at this level, and every so often there's one at that level. So, um, you need to be honest with yourself and with your colleagues. So with your advisors and your colleagues, you need to discuss this and debate it. If you aim too high, right, if you go to an international impact rated journal with a paper that's really not at that level, or if you go to science, instead of going to just an international journal, you're wasting your time because it's gonna take between, you know, for science, sometimes it's as short as five minutes for them to reject you. 
<laughs> and sometimes it's as long as half a year for your paper to reject it, not at Science, at other journals. So you're wasting your time because you're doing two submissions, but you're also wasting the time of the reviewers and the editors. Now if you aim too low, there's other costs. Definitely it's less credit for you. Maybe that paper that could have been in you know, ecology is in the you know, transactions of the Kansas Academy of Sciences. And so it's definitely less credit for you and less attention to your work because to some degree, not, not universally, higher profile journals see more attention from um, the rest of the community. So this is kind of a balancing act. You want to push the paper as high up as you can because it'll help you and your work into the future and yet, if you push too high, you're just wasting time. So with one of my former students, I developed a really, really interesting paper. Uh, basically, what it was showing was that even though bird distributions, this was 10 years ago, but bird distributions in the US hadn't shifted northward with warming climates, in spite of the range limit staying stable, the numbers were swelling northward and declining southward. And we showed that effect in like 60% of the bird species of North America. Highly non-random, really interesting. We submitted it to a good journal and the reviewers trashed us. Didn't like this, didn't like this, didn't like this. And so it was the sort of thing where, you know, you. You put on your tool ba belt and you fix up that paper and you work it out with the reviewers. But I got lazy and so what I did was I saw some new journal. It was a new journal that I am positive none of you has ever seen and the name was Biodiversity. I think it published two issues and then died. And so that paper that we published was lost. You know, obviously they accepted it like that. Nobody ever cited it, and nobody even knows we did it. Just because we underpublished it. 